Okay, so we did terrain analysis, and we were supposed to also, for that little part of Project 2, do some vector SQL querying stuff, and I thought, okay, too much going on in terrain analysis, so we'll break it apart. That's what we're going to do in this one. Hopefully this will be a, a, a shorter uh, practicum, sort of mid, not really a standalone practicum, but useful for Project 2 because you're going to need to do this, okay? So basically if we're on Project 2, this part right here, even though it, it seems a little larger, <laughs> it'll be it'll happen a little bit faster. Okay, and this is a useful uh, suite of tools for simply querying uh, the value of raster maps at specific points, but also with to manipulate uh, to, to search through the attribute tables of your vector data and to pull out uh, subsets of it to work with. Okay, so that's what we're going to start with. We're going to start with the Wadi Hasa Sites file. And to uh, get to the attribute table, it's similar to what we did in QGIS. We're going to right click and go to show attribute table. And there it is. And we can uh, just make this real big. And you can see it's a big spreadsheet. And there's a whole bunch of columns in there. And you might be thinking, what in the heck are all these crazy things? Well, your ans uh, questions will be answered. If you go into the project 2 file you downloaded and unzipped, there's the database code subfile. Uh, subdirectory and there's three little, little CSV files which if you double click they'll uh, open up in your um, spreadsheet software whether that's Excel or in my case it's LibreOffice. So I opened two already just to save a little time. There's the temporal periods and the site type codes. Um, basically what we've got is temporal code which was used in the database way back in the day because remember the number of characters were limited so they used these codes and here's the explanation of what they mean. EB are anything that's from the early bronze age and then EB1 means it's specifically to the early bronze one period. Um, Cal is Calcolithic, PN, Pottery Neolithic, PPN, Pre-Pottery Neolithic, okay? And you can see how many time frames we actually have all the way up until late Islamic period. There's a lot of stuff out there in the desert in central Jordan. Over here for the site type codes, uh, same deal. Site uh, space was limited in the original database and so they used these abbreviations and this is what they mean. Aqueduct, camp, bridge, you know, farm, mound, rock alignment, etc. Okay, so I picked these two because these are probably the two most useful bits of information that you're going to want uh, to have at your disposal to continue forward because what I need you to do is to pick out a subset of a meaningful subset of sites out of the whole Wadi Hasa survey um, uh, survey database and you need to extract them so that you're only working with them because you don't really care if you're interested in the Neolithic you don't really care about the location of Byzantine sites or uh, Mamluk sites or something like that. You only care about the Pottery Neolithic sites. Um, and you may want to be even more just, uh, you know, more selective because you may not care about all the Pottery Neolithic sites, only the ones that have been labeled as, uh, you know, like a habitation site, like a farm or a hamlet or something like that. Now it may not matter, you have to choose which one of these, you know, how, to, how selective you want to get knowing that the more selective you get the smaller the sample size you have to work with and then your statistics uh, you know your statistical sample size is going to be smaller so a lot of them like mean and standard deviation that we're about to calculate might be a little less meaningful. Now, that may not matter because you really only care about Neolithic habitation sites you gotta work with the Neolithic habitation sites that have been found and there might not be that many okay but if you're in like you know Roman or Byzantine there might be a ton of hamlets and also a ton of things like guard towers or roads and you might want to not deal with those so you might need to get more or less selective okay so first thing here's the attribute table there's a series of tabs along the bottom browse data manage tables manage layers browse data is exactly like it says it's just you can browse and you can highlight and you can just highlight and zoom to it just like you can in QGIS so pretty similar uh, to that okay uh, manage tables if we wanted to add uh, a new column now we can't add a column to Wadi Hasa sites because it's in permanent and remember we made the working map set 
all our new maps are going to be in working and that's a good thing because it's like when you put stuff in permanent you're not supposed to mess with it so we're going to deal with adding columns in a little bit because what we're going to do is extract a subset of sites and make a brand new vector file automatically and it's going to put it in our current map set which I called working but you could have called project 2 or whatever you chose okay so that's a good thing we can browse these data we can query these data but we can't overwrite them by accident because we put them in the permanent map table okay so how are we going to do our selection we're going to use an SQL query and at the bottom of the browse data tab you have this SQL query and you have the simple and the builder okay so simple is simple pick a column and that's our case we can uh, pick sorry oops let's pick um, I'll, I'll just go with my um, Neolithic uh, let me find my Neolithic column I think we call PPN uh, column and I can s basically read this as select star meaning anything it's a wild card anything from Wadi has a site, so the name of the, the vector database, or the vector that we're looking at here, where PPN, and then we can pick an operator, equals, exclamation point equals is not equals, less than, less than equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, anyone that we want. In our case, if we look at these columns, these are binary. They have a zero if in this particular site they found uh, EB they put uh, a 1 if they didn't find it they put a 0 okay same deal for all of these things you get a new column for each time frame and if it's a 0 then that time frame is present at the site if it's a 1 uh, is, is not present at the site if it's a 1 then it is present so all we have to do is PPN equals 1 it's a pretty simple query and we hit apply and it will find all the ones that are PPN and it will highlight them and uh, let me show you what that will look like on our map over here. All the yellow ones are the ones that it just found, okay? So um, you can scroll down through them, etc., etc., etc. So if all I was interested in was all the PPN sites, that did it. And I'm basically ready to go. I can make a new map by right clicking and hitting extract. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But before I do that, let's say we wanted a more sophisticated query where we cared about more than one column and what the value was in it well then we have to go to the builder tab and if you know SQL you can just start typing it in over here but if you want some little help you can click this SQL builder and it at least shows you all the column names and it gives you the operators and a couple other little things which will become handy and it will help you verify if you typed everything correctly so we already have our select star from WHS sites. We just need our where clause uh, to do that. So let me just add, uh, go back in and add our PPN. Uh, sorry, PPN, you don't have to click those. You just click on that and it should be here. Where, I actually clicked on another one before. Where PPN uh, equals, and then I can type one and then let's say I want a PPN and the pottery Neolithic which is the PN so I can put or PN equals one now it's important to use or in this case because if we hit and it will only give us sites that have both PPN and PN components to them we want PPN or PN so give me all of them whether it's both or, or, or just one or the other okay and if we wanted to, we can now go and add in our uh, site type codes here. So in this case, let's say we really wanted to focus on hamlets. Uh, well, let's first apply that one and see what it, uh, what it does. So when I hit this, now we've got a slightly expanded set. But if we look over here, and we go to our site type. We got village, sherd scatter, farm, cave, camp, enclosure, lithic scatter, lithic scatter, lithic scatter. So the simplest thing for me, I mean, maybe I really want the villages, okay? So, but I could just go with lithic scatters, and I can add that. 
I can use my SQL builder if I really wanted to and I could go to uh, you know I could rebuild what I have but since it puts it in here and I basically know what I'm doing I can just type in here and now I can put site underscore type equals LTH scat. And hit enter. Oops. So maybe I should have used the <laughs> SQL builder. Let's do it the right way, okay? And so here we go. VPN equals one or PN equals one and site type usually it loads all the values for some reason it's not doing that for me uh, and I think here I have to put since those are numbers they don't need quotes I have to put quotes around it and that's probably what I did wrong over there LTH scat EF driver statement error okay give me two seconds to pause for the cause and I'll figure it out haha -ha, I do this every time SQL is an esoteric language you can't use double quotes you have to use single quotes when you're dealing with text data when the values you're querying are numbers you don't need any quotes and when there's text in them you have to put single quotes around it so here I put select star wildcard any from WH sites where PPN equals one or PN equals one and site type equals lith scat. And there we have all our pre pottery and pottery Neolithic lithic scatters. And you could continue with this, alright? Uh, you'd have to put some parentheses in there but you could then concatenate different site types and so you could search for villages and farms and enclosures and camps right so you can make a really long statement here and uh, let me pause real quick so you don't have to watch me type this and I will do that and I will switch from lithic scatters and I will do exactly what I said camps enclosures villages and farms and I'll show you my final statement so just give me another quick pause to do that okay I'm back I've typed out my much more complicated SQL's query over here so I told you you needed parentheses so select all from what else the sites where parentheses PPN equals one or PN equals one parentheses closed and parentheses another one site type equals farm or site type equals enclosure or site type equals village or site type equals camp close parentheses now it's much like algebra you have to nestle the things in parentheses because the order of operations would be messed up if you didn't have them if you had this and in here it's going to screw up all the various ors that come after it so if you want to do something this complex you can get as crazy as you want following all of the rules of sql and here's the result of my query. You can see I have a, a lot fewer sites that are uh, that are any of these kinds of um, you know potential habitation sites. Most of the Neolithic ones are like shirt scatters, so I would have had a bigger sample had I stuck with shirt scatter or um, lithic scatter. Anyway, I finally got my subset of sites. I'm happy with it. Let's make a new file by right-clicking, extract selected features. And here we have a new uh, vector map name. I'm going to call these Neolithic Habitation Sites. I'm going to click OK. And so we can close our, our guy here. And if we go over here, it adds it, but it's not selected. So we'll click it. And now we have our Neolithic Habitation Site and let's go ahead and color it in red and give it a uh, red squares okay just so we can see what's going on there they are 
Now, now that we've finally got our sites, we can open up that table. Uh, show attribute data. There's our table. And you can see it's just for these sites. And now, because this is in the current map set that we're editing, we go to manage table. If we want to, we can add a new column and we can add data in there. So what are we going to want to do? Well, let's pull in some of that basic topographic information that we generated in the previous practicum. Slope, aspect, landform, and flow accumulation. So let's make a bunch of blank columns and then we'll use the query tools to automatically populate them by querying what's underneath. Okay. So the first one is going to be slope in lowercase. Let's pick a double, which means you, you have the ability to have decimal points because it does have that. And we'll click add. And now we have a new column at the bottom. Let's do aspect. We'll leave it as double. Doesn't really matter. I, th I think it has got some uh, decimal point value in there. Um, let's do flow ACC and that's double as well. And now let's do landform. And here, I believe uh, it's an integer value that you're going to have to use the manual from uh, ARM param scale to figure out what the label is. Now the label shows up on the raster, but it may not show up when we query over here. So let's do landform as an integer. And in case we can do it, I have to refresh my memory. And for label, let's see if that will let us do it. And we'll do that as what we call ver care, which is text. Okay. Okay. So if we go back to our browse data tab, we scroll over. Here's all our new columns. They're all blank. So let's get the GIS to help us drag the data from those raster files into our table here. And how we're going to do that? Oops, is under the vector menu we're going to go to update attributes and we're going to pick there's a bunch of these like you know from vector from areas but we're going to sample raster map at point locations v.what.rast okay so here's our vector points neolithic habitation sites here is the name of the existing map that we want to query from so let's just start with our slope map and what we can do is we can just pick the value of the cell that is directly under the XY point of our point, you know, the sites in our points map, or we can say, hey, just sample in a little neighborhood around. That usually gives a slightly better result, so let's check that button, interpolate values from the four nearest cells. And we have to pick the name of the column that we want to upload the data to, so we made all those new columns. Let's pick the one called slope, and we hit run. And if we go over to our table over here and hit refresh, boom, all our slope is in there. Now it's just rinse and repeat. So let's do aspect, optional, pick our new aspect column, hit run, double check that it did it by hitting refresh. And we'll do flow accumulation next. Pick the column, hit run, double check that it looks good. Now, let's see what the happens when we do our landforms 12 by 12. And let's see what happens over here. So it took the value. And let's just see what happens. Uh, categories and values. Okay. Well, let's just see what happens if we put it in the text one. I'll probably just put the number in there. We'll hit run. Yeah, column type not supported. So it's, uh, uh, to get the labels out, we would have to do some raster operations, which I'm not prepared to do for you at this moment. It's possible, but um, we'll just stick with the code that we have here already. So that's good. Um, since we uh, don't need this landform label, let's right click on it and say drop selected column. And we'll say, do you really want to do that? Yes, in this case, we want to delete it, and now that last column is gone, okay? So this is great. We have all this raw data in here. We can peer at it and, you know, kind of wrap our minds around it. 
But let's get some summary statistics about the numbers in these columns. It's pretty simple. Go to Vector, again, in the menu, and go down to Reports and Statistics, and Univary Attribute Statistics for Points, V.Univare. And what we'll do, here's our V.Univare. We'll just make this a little bigger. It's already got my vector map selected because it's the one that's selected over here in the in the layer manager. Uh, pick the name under the optional tab of the column we want to calculate our stats for. Uh, let's start with slope. And uh, we can just hit run. And here we have the mean, 8.99. And the, the standard deviation, which is 6. So basically what that means is that we have an average slope of 9 degrees plus or minus 6 in our little population over here. And if we look in here, we can see that, in fact, uh, a lot of the values are pretty close to the mean here, although we have a few that are on reasonably steep areas and a few that are on pretty flat areas. So that's useful. And we have that summary over here, minimum to maximum. We also have um, you know, a few other things if you're a statistician you might want to know about kurtosis, kurtosis and skewness. Um, one thing we might want to know is like the 90th percentile. So we'll click the extended statistics box and then we got a bunch more stuff. We get the first quartile and the third quartile and the 90th percentile. And that can help us later on when we have to figure out cutoffs and slope for our predictive model these values can be helpful. So what you can do at this particular point is uh, you can highlight all this stuff, you can copy it, and you can open up a, a text file uh, or a Word file or whatever, and paste it in there, and then, you know, talk about what this is. So this is slope stats, you know, Neolithic villages, etc. right? So save that for later. <laughs> and all you have to do now is the same deal before. You just pick the next column for aspect, hit run. There they are. And you can just copy that out. Aspect, uh, paste it in there, and then chug along, right? Do your same deal with flow accumulation, hit run. Copy, paste it in there. And then later on, you can put this into your spreadsheet, or you can put this into your report, or again, you can use um, you can use any of these values for when we're doing our predictive model down the line. Um, just to note that the, this, the univariate stats are useful for actual numeric data. They are on what they call ratio scale, or scales that are continuous like this. Um, not so much for categorical data, although we can try it. So let's see what happens. Uh, oops, we're in the optional tab, and we pick our landform. We can hit run, and we're going to get, uh, you know, values of like the average. Where is the average and all of this? 3.185. Well, that doesn't mean anything because it's, a, it's an ordinal scale. The, the numbers don't really mean anything in terms of their order. They're just different kinds of landforms. So it doesn't really tell us anything about that case. In that case, we would want... Um, whoops. Where did I go? Where is my... Too much stuff going on at once. Um, in that case we would rather get something like the mode or, or something like that um, which would be helpful for figuring out the most common value that is in your particular data set but for v, for whatever reason v univer doesn't give us the mode we'd have to find it a different way okay that's basically it for this one relatively short and sweet and uh, yeah that's it for this week.